Remember everything I tell you? Yep. Sounds like some this is going to benefit you too. Okay. So. Start bringing a tape recorder if you're yeah. having a test. Well, it's, it's, on, YouTube. it's on YouTube. Right? He tape records it all and puts it on YouTube. So. Yeah, so you don't have to have that. All you have to do is go to YouTube. Right? All right, so basically what you have here, we're talking about these electrical circuits here. The little Everybody's guy will be here in a minute. Huh? Everybody's not in Yeah. But uh, anyway, they'll be here in a minute. They're washing their hands. All right, so everybody understands that. And this is going to seem kind of elementary, but a lot of the times you stumble across something new that you didn't think about. Current flow goes which way? According to conventional theory, it goes from what? Right. Where does it start? According to the conventional theory, it starts from positive and goes to negative. According to electronic theory, it starts from negative and goes to positive. But since you've got an electron jumping from atom to atom on the valence ring, you guys know what the valence ring on an atom is, right? Yes, the part that's Well, the part, no, that's, you're talking about the nucleus. Now, the valence ring on an atom is actually the outer shell, and those are the, where the atoms, the electrons can jump from atom to atom. Like if you feed an electron in the front when you're playing with your phone over there, it'll actually jump from uh, atom to atom and it comes out the other end. If you ever play, you play pool, you can line up a bunch of billiard balls on a pool table and you can hit one on this end and all of them will sit there but one on the other end will take off. Right? And so that's kind of like those electrons, whatever you put in them here it goes out on the other end and it's up those atoms. But if you've got eight atoms in the valence ring, there's not any room for it to move, there's no hole. So that's an insulator, which would be like glass or wood or something like that, you know. And water won't conduct electricity unless it's got minerals in it. You know, a lot of people don't know that. But uh, anyway, so basically you've got current flow going through your fuse, through your switch, to your load. And see, the ground is basically the body of the car. Not that, not that big of a deal. So we trace the circuit in the direction that runs opposite to the current flow. All right, so what am I talking about there? If I've got a lamp that doesn't work, let's just say one of your stoplights doesn't work on one of those trucks out there. Um, if you really wanted to track it the way most people do, <laughs> see if you just got one stoplight not working, you know it's not a fuse. You got to think about what is it not? Well, it's not a fuse. You know, if the high mount stoplight and the other stoplight work and I mash the pedal, then I know the switch isn't the problem, I know the fuse isn't the problem, right? So I'm basically going to go to the stoplight that's not working and I'm going to see if I have power there whenever the brake lights are applied. So we're starting right here. You got it? Right, now then, okay, the automobile, the hot or the positive wire is usually the only wire running to most components. The ground side wire was usually connected directly to the chassis or the engine. There are uh, exceptions to that. Some of the cars will have a horn, for example, that's actually got two wires going to it. One of them is ground and the other one's going to be the one that tells the horn to blow. Uh, most horns, you know, the olden days, they would have the bracket would ground the horn and you just have one wire going to it. The two wires go into a horn, you know, like where if your horn doesn't work. Let's say that you've got a, your horn's dead, and if it's a car that's only got one horn on it instead of two, you know, like a lot of them will have two horns for a high note and a low note. The old Oldsmobiles had like three note horns, and it made it almost sound like a train. A train whistle's got four notes, you know, that's why it sounds so unique. But anyway, if you have more than one horn and only one of them's blowing, and the other two are dark, then you go check and see if you got power going to those horns. If you got power going to them, they're not working, then the horn's bad. That's the same way with electronic module. You got power and ground going to it, and it's not working. You know, it's typically the module becomes suspect, although it doesn't always mean it's bad. If it's got something else in front of the lamp shown in this illustration is the ground symbol. Right on the lamp symbol to indicate the lamp socket is self-grounded only by direct attachment to a metal part. So uh, basically what you got right here, most non-automotive circuits are known as two-wire circuits because they use a second wire instead of a chassis ground for the return side of the circuit. The return side is the ground. When you hear about return, like even in the electronic system, when you're talking about signal return, you're talking about a ground, it goes back to the engine controller. All right, in an automobile power window seat and power door lock, there are two wire circuits. They use a chassis ground to feed the switch, and it reverses polarity to reverse motor direction. That's not always true on some of the older GM cars. They would have a basically a ground, and then they would have two wires that would be, you know, power would go to one and then the other on all that. So, uh, it's like that. I'll talk to him later. All right. So, on series circuits, 
refers to a condition where two or more components are connected after another in a single loop. That's like this right here. You got a source, you got a fuse, you got a switch, you got a bolt. A lot of us don't think about the fact that the switch and the fuse are actually part of a series circuit. Right? But aren't the switch and the fuse supposed to use any power? Does, does the fuse use any power? It does. It just flows through it. Does the switch use any power? What are the what's the what is the exceptions to this? If you have a switch with dirty contacts, you're going to use, lose some power there, and we call that voltage drop. If you've got a fuse that's blown, we're going to lose power there totally. Like if I'm measuring right here from here to here with my meter, and that fuse is blown, what am I going to read if I measure from here to here with my meter? 12 volt system voltage. You, you're dropping 100% of your voltage across the fuse. The input of the other is there. All right, so two important points to remember about series circuit. If the filament of any lamp in a series circuit burns out, none of the lamps will light. Uh, you, ever, you remember Christmas tree lights? Some of them would have, you'd have series circuit if one bulb was out. You know how much of a pain it was to find out which bulb that was? Because you had all them bulbs on there. All right, every load has resistance to current flow, and that means the combined resistance in a series circuit is going to be equal to the individual resistances added together. And so basically, if you add all the resistances together in a series circuit, it's going to be, that's why if you got, you know, a 10 and a 10 and a 10, and they're in series, and you measure them, you're going to have 30 if you add them all together. All right. Now, you got current flow here, seeing so you know, like this is one of the lower speed controls. All right, and now uh, what you got here, the wired in series with its fuse and its switch. So going through the fuse, through the switch, you got a speed control resistor that's part of the series circuit, and you got a bore motor going to ground. And your current flows right there. With a switch in the off position, no current flowing because it can't get there. All right, that ain't really complicated, is it? All right, and so with a switch in the low position, as illustrated here, current's got to flow through the speed control resistor and the blower <coughs> motor. The resistor drops some of the voltage and the blower runs slow. Right there. So you, you measured it from here to here. You measured the voltage that was being lost on the way to that motor. There's your source, which is your battery. And there's your little switch right there. With it in high, you basically are going to get all the power that can be delivered unless the switch has got some voltage drop or, you know, there's maybe somebody put some sort of an accessory in there and had spread the terminals in the fuse box. One of the most annoying things you'll ever try to find is a situation where somebody has rammed something in there and spread those fuse terminals. Or when you put the fuse in there, it's actually not touching anything. And you check it and it's hot on one side and it's hot on the other side with your test light. But when you, tink, when you tweak it and mess with it, the power comes and goes at whatever you're checking. You know what I mean? That's really irritating. And I've had, to, and it's hard to get in there and fix that if somebody has done that. But when people used to put a lot of cell phones on cars and stuff, when everybody, when people weren't carrying cell phones in their pocket, they were putting them in their car. They used to, the cell phone places used to do a lot of that kind of stuff. Now here's a parallel circuit. Okay, that one right there, you got a common point and a common point. And whenever two or more clothes are collected side by side and controlled by the same switch, they operate independently of each other. That one blows, this one still works. That one blows, this one still works. And there's your little knife switch you're showing in there. Full system voltage for each member of the circuit. In a series circuit, it's got to be divided. In this particular one, the current's divided, but the voltage is not. Okay? And so, okay, here we go. Parallel circuit, each of the loads draws current independently of the other. If A and B are equivalent bulbs, it'll use twice as much amperage as a single bulb. All right, so here's your parallel circuit right here. Uh, a and B are in parallel. See, that light can burn even if a motor doesn't work, and a motor can burn even if a light doesn't work. Now, load A, parallel feed wires, not all that complicated. They have a common feed for the battery the fuse, but they operate independently. And the common points any place, the terminal splice connection, that's a splice connection right there. When you see two lines coming together and it's got a little dot connecting them, that's a splice connection. What it'll look like on the car is they'll, uh, whenever they build wire harnesses at the factory, they'll actually run some wires together and they'll use some heat. They don't solder them. They use heat to melt that copper together right there where that splice is. And then they'll wrap it in some tape. And they, that splice, they, even the shop manual will tell you where to find that splice. But if the splice is way up behind the dash in a harness about that big around and you're having to take the dash out and cut to it, sometimes it's just smart to run another wire. <laughs> We've done that before. You know, whatever gets it working, it's not dangerous and is reliable, is just as good. And whenever I'm running another wire, I'll run it through loom. 
or I'll run it in such a way to where it'll stay out of trouble and it will look professional. You know, have you ever seen crummy looking wiring that just makes you think, who did this nonsense, you know? I mean, what were they even thinking about? Yeah, so uh, anyway, here's a parallel circuit right here, sort of. All right, see that right there, a parallel circuit. The old thing there. Okay, headlamps and parking lamps are a typical example of the both in the same parallel on the same circuit. Although headlamps will typically be uh, on a headlamp, the way a headlamp switch is usually wired is you'll basically have one feed coming into the headlamp switch and going out to the headlights, uh, and another feed will come from another fuse and will go out to the park lights. So this isn't really a totally true statement. And a lot of the times you'll have a fuse for each one of the headlights. Now in the old days, they would put a circuit breaker in the headlight switch. Built in, you couldn't change it, it was just in there. And sometimes that circuit breaker would get weak. And whenever the lights were on high beam where they were pulling a lot of current, you'd be driving down the road and they'd start winking off and on. And all that. There's one guy worked really hard to change out a headlight switch in a 72 LTD back when I was working at yeah, Davis's in 77. He was over writing his clipboard what work he did. That's how we keep up with work. We didn't get paid at the end of the week. And he had, had to pull all the dash out to get up there and change that switch because the lights were blinking off and on. And while he was writing on there, the headlights were shining on the wall. You know, I came by and turned the lights off and on a couple of times and shook him up pretty bad because he thought it was still working. All right. So, basically, you got a series of parallel circuits. Uh, you got a headlamp switch, cluster control, resistor brightness control. When you dial that little thing with your thumb, bring your dash lights up and down. You know, sometimes uh, you basically will be like on Chevrolet. Chevrolet was just really brilliant the way they did this for a while. They actually had a power transistor there and it had three legs on it. And one of them, as I remember, it was delivering ground. Could be wrong. But anyway, no, I think it had power going through it to the uh, dash lights. And you had a little potentiometer. And the more of a ground you put on that base post, the more it would let go through. And it had a little heat sink on that thing. And it was a pain because those things like to die. A little transistor would go bad. Then you had to go up in there and change it out. And that was fairly common on some of the, you know, mid-90s Camaro. Uh, there's your part of your cluster printed circuit, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a combination of series and parallel circuits. So you got series and parallel circuits made together. There's your simplified cluster lamp circuit with a bunch of little bulbs in there. Part of the cluster printed circuit, so so we're seeing that. A uh, typical schematic print from the cluster lights. And all that. Now some of these, like that one right there I'm holding in my hand behind that, they, that was one I worked on that came out of a Lightning, an F-150 Lightning back in uh, 2000 or whatever it was, about working here. And there were no bulbs on that thing, but it didn't work. That entire thing was supposed to light up when it got power. And it made a beautiful cluster, but when it went dark, you had to replace the whole instrument cluster because they didn't have any bulbs in there. Now, that wasn't on anything except the lighting back then where that happened. Now, these four lamps were wired in parallel and so on and so forth. I'm not going to variable resistor, you know, goes up and down. You can kind of see that. And that's what that looks like with your phone on it and all that. All right, the resistance of the cluster dimmer changes while you turn it. Not complicated. Now, <coughs> we're going to be talking a little bit about wiring schematics. Some of you guys are struggling with this. Okay, forward and early genome schematics uh, kind of look like this right here. The top of most schematics is usually hot and the bottom is usually brown. So the ground coming in. Tell you a little something about these schematics here. There's your connector number. What does C103F and C103M stand for? Female and male, and then you got your circuit number, you got your wire color, and this right here is what? Why have they got these brackets? What's that for? Anybody remember? We've talked about this before. Alternate current path. If it's an automatic transmission, it has a neutral safety switch. If it's a manual transmission, it only's got the backup mount switch. But this right here is talking about the backup mounts anyway. See? All right. And so the bottom is the ground and top. So let's start by tracing power from hot to ground. Okay, where's connector C172? Now basically, through circuit 295 and connector C172, the male side of the connector is C172M. And look at there, I'll put MAI on there. It's 172F. All right, so you got that right there. 
you know, basically what we're looking at is we're basically we're going to decide to find out why the backup lights don't work is what we're trying to do here. All right, so we're going to find where is C172? Anybody see it on this grid? Uh, but right up there, and it's pointing right here. That is a pretty good sized connector. It's right under the hood. It's fairly easy to see. And um, all right then. So here we go. Using the numbers and letters, that's that A6. Now what we used to have to do whenever we were doing warranty repairs on a vehicle that's still under warranty, we would have to print this page and we would have to put the, or, or not print the page necessarily, but tell them where it was, the grid location of the repair. Like if I had to repair wire right there, I had to go B6 so they could actually say it was right in this area right here. All right, this is what that connector looks like. We gotta go to the connector view so we can determine which pin it is we wanna find in that connector. All right, now what was it? Where is the, uh, what was the circuit number? Does anybody remember? Nobody remembers the circuit number. 142. Make it up as you go. All right, let's see here. What is it? What's the circuit number? Uh, 295. 295. Where in the world did 142 come from? All right, you see 295 on there anywhere. Where's circuit 295? Uh, right there. And it's also over here because you're looking at both sides of the connector. See that? All right. So circuit so pin 34. You see pin 34 up here? Where's pin 34? I can't read it. Huh? I can't read it. All right. That's 34, 35, 36, 37. Uh, see, that's 34. So 34 and 34. See how these are mirror images of each other? The point I'm trying to make is you can go directly to the pin in the big connector. And that may be where your trouble was, or it may not, but you can doggone sure check both sides of it from there. You can break the circuit down this way. Uh, pin number 34, you pay attention to the color of the wire, and you say, okay, that's a light blue pink, which is the color we're looking for. All right, we're located where it passes through a connector, up there. Now we not only know where C172 is, we know what the connector pinout looks like, because we looked this up, and we know which pin is number 34 on the connector, so we can put our hand right on that pin, look at both sides of it, right? I will tell you something else too, if you're doing an installation of something like an alarm or whatever, and I've done this before, if you find a pin that's not used in one of these that goes through the bulkhead, you can basically get some the right kind of connectors and put the connectors in there so that instead of drilling a hole in the bulkhead, you're actually going through a connector like it was a factory installation. I've done that before myself. The truck could have either two switches, depending on which it's equipped, there's your alternate current path. And so it's drawn as an alternate current path when it's got that bracket right there. All right, you also notice that both of those wires, you know, even on both, no matter which way it's done, they're all going through that same connector. The wires going in and out of the switch question both paths are that C172. And after the circuit passes through the switch, the circuit number changes from 295 to 140. That's important. So now your circuit number is different. After it passes through the switch, it's no longer circuit 295, it's now circuit 140. So when you start to see what those numbers mean, this gets a whole lot more sensible. All right, let's have a look at connector pinout for connector C172. And there that one is, and that's circuit number 140. All right, you see there? Okay, so there's 140, pin 12. Where's pin 12 up there? Anybody see it? 1206. Right there, see that? And it's over there. This is, like I say, mirror image once again. All right. We know that pin 34 and 32 are both part of the backup mount circuit. Neither pin could be the cause of the problem. Okay. Want to get that number screwed up or what? I don't know. It's been a while since I've done this. All right. It passes through the splice and two more connectors. Remember, you're always going to go to the easiest connector first. If one of them is buried under the dash and one of them on top of the engine, you go to one on top of the engine first, but it's the easiest one to get to. The splice could be a problem, and it's usually taped into the harness and can be difficult to locate. So the, that's the last place you want to go. Right? So there's your splice right there, and there's your connector. Connector C148 in our location drawing is where? Anybody see it? Anybody see it? What's that? Right there. Got a connector right there. That's connector C148. This is what it looks like. How many pins are in that connector? 16. Got what? 16. 16 pins. So you got four and four, right? 
The pinout legend is a little different. Find circuit 140 and double check the wire color to make sure we're still on track. And we can find the connector on the vehicle, then locate the pin in the connector so we can check the integrity of the circuit. Let's say we had power going through that other 172, but now we go to 140 and we got power going on one end one side but not coming out the other. We know we got a problem right there. But if power is going through that one, also we can actually have our bulbs in place back there and we can check to see if we have a ground coming through that bulb. That's a good thing to do there. All right, so let's go on to C411 the same way. All right, now where's 411? Right there. Okay, back there in the back. All right, the circuit number we're looking for, how many pins in this connector here? Once again, we go to this connector, find the pin in question, check the circuit. All right, there it is right here. See that? Pin 5. All right, our last connector in line is C403. Find it on the vehicle like we did the others. See there, C403 right there. Look at that. We're down to eight pins now. See how it starts out with lots and lots of pins, and it goes down to fewer and fewer pins, and you're zeroing in on it. Uh, find it here, write it down. Uh, once we, we go to the connector on the vehicle, find the pending question, check the circuit. By this time, we ought to have more of a handle where the problem is. All right, look at that. One or more potential problem is the ground, G104. Okay, where's G104? Where do you think G104 is? Ground. Huh? Is it a Where would you think it would be? Bottom side. Huh? On the bottom side. Bottom side. On the bottom side of what? Where do you think it will be located on the truck? Just look at the schematic. Give me any kind of idea. Now, I'll tell you this. When you see that it's got a bunch of brakes, all they're telling you, there's other places this ground goes besides to that place right there. It, go, it feeds other things besides these lights. That's what it means when you've got a dotted ground line right there. See it on there? G104 runs all the way. Think about this. If I was to go to a truck like this and I took that ground loose and the backup lats went out, you would be totally bumfuddled because the ground for the backup lats, which is on the back end of the truck, is under the hood on the left side over there. You got me? Now, if you don't know how to locate that, now what you might do in the back is splice into that and put you a ground somewhere. But if you come up here and found out it, Whoever put the truck back together last time didn't tighten that screw, and that's why your backup lights didn't work. You can also find out what else this ground feeds, and find if you're, you know, before you go look at it, and say, is there anything else that doesn't work right? Or sometimes you'll turn on one load and something else will come on because it's basically got grounds, or maybe this is working. You turn this on and it goes off because it was getting the ground through that bulb. All right, so the ground looks really close, but it's way up here in the front of the truck. Okay, notice the ground for the backup lights is the opposite end of the vehicle. GM schematics, and at this time they were new, they basically looked, the, the later model would look like this. See that representation of the vehicle speed sensor on a GM schematic? These are your navigation buttons up there. Got these hot buttons, and the top button leads to a locator page. The magnifier at the bottom left is supposed to open the schematic in a way that it can be enlarged. You know, we've got this stuff available, but look what GM does. GM basically takes you to this page where you've kind of got to find it. Vehicle speed sensor, engine controls, component views, and connector end views. Now, it does give you links feed leading to both of those, and it gives you a location and all that. So, basically, you go to the engine controls, component views. Now, when you click on that, you see this screen right here. And you're sitting there saying, huh, wait a minute. You know, how much of you see what I'm saying? How crazy it is, but you say, I know I'm looking for a speed sensor, it's probably going to be right here, probably. And so then when you finally click on that, uh, it's going to tell you the vehicle speed sensor that's out of number one is right here, gives you a picture. See, they're basically trying to make it where you can track down problems without having to wrestle with them and guess at things and, you know, run other wires that don't need to be run and all that. All right. Now then, who learned something that they didn't know when they sat down in here? You know how to track that stuff down now. It ain't really that complicated. As long as you can get connector views and locations, harness routings, 
there have been times when I've seen the wire harnesses say that a connector was in one spot and it'd be somewhere else. That's a little annoying when I find that. And we used to have electronic dealer service reports where we would send in and tell them, you know, that they, you know, I would type those things up and send them in all the time. And, uh, it's kind of funny on that service bay diagnostic system. Uh, I managed to get a little program loaded on a floppy disk where I could look in there and I could type stuff on that, and, and I could print it out. I would. They had special service messages that would come out, and it would say, you know, cars in this particular region may have issues with this not working because of this connector not being seated and this kind of thing, or reflash the module if they have this problem stuff. And I would. I typed up this bogus. Uh, special service message, I would print those out every day and hang them up there for all the mechanics to read them. They would go up there and they'd read them and see if there was anything they'd run into that day. And uh, our service manager's name was Mark Moore. And, uh, so what I did was, whenever I typed up this thing and I said, uh, uh, Mark Moore, because of uh, the uh, sales performance for the month of July, has won a Bahamas cruise and he will be escorted by Susan Anton or whatever. And so when everybody went to him and told him, hey, man, you won this Bahamas cruise because it was mixed in with other special service messages. And he went all over the dealership telling everybody he had won a cruise and all this stuff. I mean, just told everybody in the sales department. And the service manager, I mean, the, the, the general manager came back there and I says, he says, what did you, uh, and, I, and he was talking to him about something else. I said, did you hear about Martin Moore's cruise? He goes, yeah, that's something. And I said, that's bogus. I'm, I made that up. And he goes, huh, he's going to shoot you. <laughs> but what was funny was, about two weeks later, that knothead did win a cruise. It was like prophecy or something. I had no clue that was coming. Now, he didn't go with Susan Anton, but the simple fact was, I would have never expected him to win a cruise, but he did, and it was two weeks after I said he had won one and it was a joke. You know, I don't get that. Okay. I got a question for you. All right. The instrument clusters on the truck I got, 